Hello everyone. So, today's session we will continue the spinal microneurosurgery that we were discussing in the last session. So, in the last session we gone through all the spinal stabilization setup and the instrument that are required for the exposure of the vertebra and the spinal cord. And we also covered the uh, major portion of cervical vertebrae exposure and how to do the laminectomy and how do we expose the cord and the dorsal root ganglion. So, in today's session, we will go through the remaining aspect of the thoraco, thora, thoracic vertebrae exposure and thoracolumbar vertebrae exposure, after which briefly we will deal with the uh, implantation strategies that are commonly used. So, having said that, the basic steps remains the same, you know the layers of exposure and the sequence of exposure almost remains the same. Uh, there are some nuances that keep adding uh, as per the strategy and these are the same nuances I keep uh, emphasizing that you will sort of uh, adopt to improvise your methodology based on the research question and the research objective that you are uh, planning to um, achieve. So, with that introduction let us look at what we are trying to uh, do today. So, cervical vertebral exposure we completed, we could not really finish the thoracic vertebral exposure that we will be covering it today. And then the spinal cord injury model which is the most common uh, model that is used and so you all should have uh, some brief idea of all the researches that is commonly employed with the spinal cord. Then a bit about micro electrode implantation, what are the strategies used and then as I uh, covered in the brain surgery a little bit about the uh, spinal windows alright. So, let us look at the uh, thoracic vertebra exposure. So, on the left hand side this is before you bring in the stabilization system you can make the uh, skin incision and then try to expose the spinal column in the uh, that comes right in the middle. So, this picture also tells you what sort of layers that would come. Um, obviously, the draping and I mean the painting and cleaning and all that has been done. Somehow, this picture does not include the draping, but draping that is always a good practice to include. Then on the right hand side, you can see that there is a T10 level exposure that has been done, uh, but before that they have tried to dissect the muscle and then try to get the exposure of the spinal column as per, um, per se. So, once the spinal column comes into view, then you can bring in this spinal stabilization setup which we discussed last time. This is more of a mechanical uh, stabilization with the mechanical impounder which has around a 10 gram weight which is a metal rod with a, a blunt tip to induce the spinal cord injury. And these are the uh, for fixation forceps which as I said earlier will be used to hold the spinous process and then you turn in this uh, you know this uh, screws and so tighten it so that it grips the spinous process. So, again as I said earlier you need to sort of figure out what sort of impact is going to happen and how much of movement is going to happen um, with the actual surgical uh, setup and then obviously the target and the objective that you are planning to employ. And if it is something where if, if it is a surgery uh, which does not really allow any sort of uh, movement to happen for example, you are handling the implantation of spinal cord then this uh, setup might not suffice because when there is a vertical movement and the vertical force acting on the spinal cord with respect to any of the surgical step, then it is better to fix the transverse process which, which give us the better rigid fixation. As I explained earlier where we compared various technique of uh, various techniques of spinal stabilization during the surgery, the retractors or the stabilization system going under the transverse process gives the best uh, rigid fixation. But for the impact if it is on the thoracic cord where there is a hump naturally uh, occurring and the spinal co column is naturally convex on the top unlike the cervical um, section 
there is natural hump which is uh, visible and palpable. So, this sort of uh, fixation probably would suffice most of the time. And then, so once you bring in the stabilization system where the upper spinous process, lower spinous process both have been uh, fixed and then what you can see here is the uh, another retraction system. This is the retraction system wherein when you twist and they keep tightening it these prongs that are seen here that would uh, sort of retract the skin and muscle tissue away from the midline you know. So, it keeps pulling it out. So, that is the uh, retractor called self you know uh, re retraction. So, SR or automated self retractor is very very um, useful self retaining retractors wherein you screw in and it retains the tissue retains and you do not really have to spend too much time in taking a stitch and putting a fixation. So, such self retaining retractors are very useful at this particular point and then you bring in the impactor which will give a dorsal force right on to the spinal cord once the vertebra uh, is exposed all right. So, that is how the impaction is done you can see this is a zoomed in view wherein you fixate the spinal uh, process using those uh, rigid fixators which is basically a forceps holding the spinous, uh, spinous process on both sides. Then these are the retractor blades where it is holding the skin and muscle tissue which is self retaining and then the tip of the uh, impo impounder is closer to the cord after you expose the cord. On the right hand side you can see the zoomed in view where the spinal cord is exposed and the dura is uh, seen. This is after the uh, impaction by the impounder there where the tip has moved already and caused an impact and contusion is seen. This bluish discoloration is basically the contusion that is a terminology used generally ok, a contusion of the cord. So, which is very close to what happens when somebody meets um, with the road traffic accident this is what happens. So, that we are trying to simulate using this artificial impaction or uh, using this impounder and creating a contusion in the spinal cord. Then the various um, subjects of uh, what changes happens in the spinal cord, what sort of cellular uh, changes are happening, what sort of biochemical markers can be studied, how does this uh, degeneration happens following the uh, tra trauma to the spinal cord all those can be studied after this basic step has been achieved. So, once the spinous process is exposed just similar to the uh, cervical vertebrae exposure that we discussed last time you process you proceed with lamin laminectomy which is again was covered and then the dura and the spinal cord is exposed bring in the impounder and cause the impaction that is the end of the uh, thoracic spinal cord impaction uh, model where the entire surgical step has been shown. So, the other method is that this is again can simulate the natural uh, injury that ha you know happens in many of the uh, road traffic accident victims wherein you uh, the direct bony injury. So, on the right hand side you can see especially here the right half of the lamina all right. So, just to orient yourself this is the lamina that is the spinous process if you all recollect from the previous anatomy class that will be the rib and you can see the uh, artificial impaction that has been done which is pretty uh, similar to what happens naturally in an accident where there is a fracture of the spinous process and the lamina especially the right half of the lamina. So, if you take an axial cut this is an imaging this is a CT imaging uh, which is not really the luxury that most of us can have it is a preclinical imaging it is called preclinical imaging. Clinical imaging is what we use in patients where MRI, CT any sort of uh, imaging 
whenever an animal model em, uh, employs an imaging process is called preclinical imaging. So, this is a preclinical imaging of the rodent where the CT scan has been employed. Okay, this is the 3D remodeling of after you acquire the CT scan, this one, this entire thing is 3D modeling. This is the actual bone window of the CT scan wherein the impact has been created artificially directly onto the spinal column there before you expose the muscle. That is another model that we can use wherein you do not really have to do laminectomy, you open up the spine, all that need, need not be done. Expose the spinal column after you make an incision with skin and subcutaneous tissue and then these stabilizers are used wherein the spinal column is stabilized by you know by a medial force. There is a, a fixators which will tighten the screws here and then make sure that the medial force has been applied and which should be equal on both sides so that it does not really induce any sort of uh, curvature in the spine. A dead neutral um, positioning is maintained before you bring in the uh, impounder which causes the fracture and then presses the cord which is seen here in the uh, right hand side. Suppose if there is a cord, this is how the cord will be alright. So, when the impaction happens there is a fracture. So, what you are seeing here is the fracture and that fracture fragment will cause again the impact on the spinal cord. So, both the bony injury as well as the cord injury can happen. So, this is a, um, a compound injury model wherein there is a fracture of the bone, bony uh, canal as well as the uh, spinal cord alright. So, this is another spinal cord injury model with the similar uh, methods of um, surgical um, exposure or thoracic vertebrae exposure alright. So, now comes the thoracolumbar vertebra wherein so this is the cervical vertebra till there is the around thoracic vertebra from here it becomes thoracolumbar and then the sacrum coccygeal and the tailbone that is how the, the spinal column that we uh, that we have seen so far. This is something similar to the thoracic vertebra exposure. So, just to orient yourself so this is the skin after you clip the hair or shave the hair off then let us look at the how the micro LED implantation really happens. So, this is another um, uh, important uh, methodology which is commonly employed now wherein you inject the uh, virus adenovirus and then which is tagged to a fluorescent uh, dye and then make the uh, nervous tissue express those uh, fluorescent proteins which with the wavelength of the laser uh, light the responses are seen alright. So, it, it stimulates something like an optogenetic uh, stimulation. So, this is the employment of optogenetic um, stimulation in the spinal model. So, this is the LED implantation to bring about such a, a methodology. So, but the process is going to be the same for any implant for that matter. But then all you need to decide is what is the um, implant that you are going to use and which layer are you going to use it. So, as I said earlier in the brain surgery you need to sort of uh, figure out which layer you are going to expose and where the implant is going to be fixed and how are you going to maintain that implant for a chronic study alright. If it is an acute study then you really do not have to worry about closure, a fixation and then a survival of the riot all that really does not matter if it is just an acute study. But if it is a chronic uh, implant study where you need to acquire the data as the animal behaves in various behavioral setups and experiments then you this surgical setup matters a lot. You know the entire survival of your equipment as well as the rodent depends on these surgical steps. So, that is why that is the reason why I keep saying that you need to plan it uh, you know every uh, minute 
and till from the opening to closure and a simulation of all your surgical steps are important. And it is better if you can have a dry run using a cadaver. You know, so, go through all the steps, see if the implant fits in because there are a lot of improvisation will be required. So, you really do not have to waste your um, allotted animal subjects just to cover up your learning curve. So, cadaver is the best uh, way to uh, circumvent that. So, these basic surgical steps will keep getting repeated, but try to focus on the step which is little different based on the um, experimental methodology that I am trying to explain alright. So, on the left hand side you make the skin incision, expose the muscular plane and, and of course, the spinal column. On the right hand side this sort of exposure we have already discussed where once the skin and subcutaneous tissue is uh, open and then retracted laterally. Here is when you can actually use the self retaining retractors as I said earlier those arc thing with the uh, screw at the top where as you twist it this will keep opening up that is all it is which is called self retaining retractors alright. So, once you bring in that it keep maintaining the layers that you are exposing that is the whole point when you, you really do not have to waste time by taking stitch in every layer and then you know putting it onto the side which not only increases the surgical time it also increases the anesthesia time and of course, you your sort of uh, your surgical field is also going to be really bigger and bigger as you go deeper alright. So, once you do that then you expose the spinal uh, process. So, what has been exposed here is the spinous process. So, these steps we have already gone through in the um, surgical step that we were discussing for laminectomy. So, spinous process has been exposed once the spinous process and the vertebra has been exposed by dissecting the muscular tissue all around then you are ready to make a laminectomy. So, as I said partial laminectomy has been done what you are seeing in the midline is your dorsal sp spinal vein not really artery dorsal spinal vein and then you can see the dura covering the uh, spinal cord alright. So, once that step is achieved then the next few step depends what sort of implant are you really planning to do. Are you planning to inject into the spinal cord then you have to sort of expose the actual spinal cord by um, incising the dura and exposing the spinal cord or if you are happy enough to put your implant outside the dura then it is called epidural alright or extra dural. These are the terminologies which are usually used in various implants that you are going to do wherein there is a dura matter alright. If this is a sagittal section that is the dural covering. If your implant is going to go outside then it is called extra dural, if it is going to go under the dura but over the spinal cord then it is called subdural. So, you have extra dural implant, you have subdural implant something inside the dural sac is intradural in which case you, you need to decide where you are going to leave it on the spinal cord then it is called extra axial, extra axial ok or intra axial if you are going to implant within the substance of the spinal cord alright. So, these are the various uh, terminologies which are surgical and very important to document and to communicate. And of course, uh, you will learn this many you know you are supposed to go into the details of these surgical steps which are available in the literature, but to cover briefly this is how it is done. So, once the dura is exposed all you need to do is to slide in the implant under the spinous process because there is a potential space between the spinous process and the dura which is called epidural space. Epi or extra is you can interchange it. So, there is extra dural space which will have fat and this fat will have veins which are called venous plexus. So, no tissues in the body is completely devoid of vessels understood. So, 
everywhere, every step you need to be conscious about what sort of vessel vascular injury you are going to do uh, to the rat and then be aware of those uh, planes and those structures that you are going to handle. Then the morbidity, surgical morbidity comes down drastically. So, as I said, so this is a, a dural sac that is the spinal cord here, all right. And you are going to leave the implant outside the dura which is extra dural. So, you really do not have to sort of do a complete laminectomy or make a wide exposure of the spinal sac. You can just make a smaller opening and then pass a dissector. The instrument is dissector or dissector. You pass under the bony spaces and make some space and then slide such uh, implants underneath it. So, that would suffice a lot. So, here in case this is the LED, this was the LED. So, which was supposed to be implanted intradurally. Extradurally, this is the coiled copper wire which works with induction, which is sort of auto generative model I implant. I am not going to the details of this implant, but then it has its own, this is, this is battery less implant. This does not have a battery, it works with induction principle, but this uh, tip of this uh, thing has an LED, you know light emitting diode which has to go under the dura and over the spinal cord. So, they make a small nick and when you do a small nick there is an egress of CSF. That is how you know for sure that you have really cut the dura or zoom in with your microscope and you actually see the cut of the dura, but it is uh, sort of important to let the CSF out. So, that spinal cord I mean the spinal uh, column becomes relaxed and then you slide in the implant. So, that the friction does not does not really come into a picture where the electrode really grazes over the spinal cord and cause injury by itself all right. So, that is that is how the final implant is going to look like. So, if you remember you have exposed and this is these are the muscles ok. This is the bony edge where you have removed the lamina and from the previous slide and this is the upper part of the coil. The tip that is light emitting diode has actually gone inside the dura and it is lying like that. And then you put the skin on top of it. The uh, major advantage in the Rodin model is that you have a lot of this loose skin to house all these all sorts of implants all right that is the big benefit. But of course, your implant uh, should be smaller and then it should be uh, friendly enough to these biological uh, tissues and planes. And what has been shown here is the surgical clips all right. So, nowadays things are really smooth and easy where you really do not have to sit and suture. It is always good to practice suturing and wound closure, but clips will do the same job much for more far easier. And other one is derma bond where you apply the gel and then stick the plasters across again that also will work. So, but then all you have to make sure is that if this is the cut edge of the skin you have to make sure that there is a good opposition of the raw edges. If the wound sort of overlaps with your, the skin edges then that sort of uh, wound definitely gapes and there will be a lot of uh, healing issues then it gets infected with bacteria and your implant will fail all right. So, it is very important whether you use suture or clips or derma bond whatever material you need to make sure this approximation of wound edges you know is perfect. So, then the healing will take place all right. So, this is an this is the same um, the similar uh, experimental methodology, but then what you are seeing here is multi level micro LED implantation. So, the reason is not to emphasize the LED um, part of it, but uh, to know how smooth the epidural space is and to what extent you really can slide these implants. And if you really have an imaging uh, you know a chance to do an x-ray or you know under fluorescence where we call usually the CM fluorescence 
where there is a transmitter and then a receiver which with an arc connected. If you have that then it is amazing but even if you do not you really can use a tactile feedback and see where the implant can be slid across the entire length of the epidural space wherein for example, if this is a T13 they have uh, they've slid the um, uh, implant almost up to uh, you know 13, 12, 11, T10. Until T10 they have uh, really uh, slid the electrode but the good thing is that you can sort of have an additional uh, exposure here at 10, T10 and use the loop to pull it across alright. So, all these uh, uh, sort of surgical steps are possible if you are in the right plane that is very very important. For example, if you are in the epidural space you will get this much of freedom whereas if you are inside the dura then you really have to be very careful to avoid injury to these rootlets then there are veins coming in and artery coming in. So, you need to make sure that you are in the right plane that one way to look at it is that if there is no CSF coming out, if there is no CSF egress which is inside the dura then you are safe and you need to make sure this dura is intact. No, at any cost there should not be any injury to the dura and CSF leak should never happen. So, only then you can make sure that there is no injury to the cord as well. If by chance during laminectomy the dura opens then you sort of have to increase the bony exposure wide enough you see the normal dura then slide the implant on top of it alright. So, these are some of the technical nuances that you will learn uh, eventually during the process but then just to complete the picture I am trying to show this particular aspect alright. So, the next aspect is the a spinal window. So, we did learn about the cranial window the process is almost uh, as similar to the cranial windows only thing is the bone fixation is going to be really different as compared to the cranial windows alright. So, the most important aspect is that if you are using such rigid mechanical fixators rather than just the disc there are n number of modifications are available to maintain the spinal window and one of which is this metal rigid fixation. It depends how long you are going to maintain the spinal window and what are the accessories that you are going to use along with this spinal window. That is what is going to decide whether you really need such mechanical rigid uh, fixators or is it enough to keep a small loop you know and then put a glue all around so that it maintains the skin away from the exposure of skin and muscles. So, all that is done here is after the skin incision is made muscle is retracted and the laminectomy is done alright and then that window is maintained by this. So, here you, you sort of have to remove these entire layer alright. So, the uh, skin can be retracted but the muscle plane has to be removed and then the bone laminectomy has to be done then your dura or the spinal cord itself can be used. So, uh, preferably the dura will be maintained in most of the time unless this involves some spinal cord injections alright. So, once that is done these sort of fixators has to be screwed in to the lateral bony edges in which case it is mostly the facet joints. So, either you use the facet or the transverse process alright. So, hope if you all remember the bony anatomy these are the bony structures wherein you can screw in these uh, fixators over top of which the metal uh, window will be uh, fixed in and that is the um, rat where the spinal window has been fixed and the most of the time these sort of windows are used for two photon microscopy. So, this we have already discussed. So, in a live rat it is amazing to see the brain in action and this is one way where you can actually look at the live brain in action when you can use these two photon microscopy where the rat is alive most probably with the injectable anesthetic. The same thing can be done with the inhalational anesthetic as well which we will be discussing it in the anesthesia section alright. So, this is another way of fixating the uh, spinal window and as I said there are retractors used 
then the dura has been uh, opened and then the use of artificial dura mainly to sort of which is thinner trans you know transparent enough to uh, allow the microscopy and this is the custom made maybe you can even 3d print such um, uh, uh, window windows where we can uh, use customize it for our own um, experiments but it's just another way of maintaining the spinal window all right so this is how the two photon microscopy generally happens you expose the uh, spinal canal maintain maintain those tissues all around which is opened and then you ma uh, maintain it with either you put a retractors and then glue it in or use any sort of the metal frames which we just discussed and then bring the whole rat under the two photon microscope <coughs> all right it is i mean the principle being the femtosecond lasers are used to send the laser impulses within a very short time wherein a uh, specific layers are you know focused and then you can see the uh, nerve cells which are lighted up with various fluorescent uh, uh, tagged markers okay that's the general principle of two photon microscopy and this is how the entire surgical setup would look like in the spinal two photon microscopy so there are a lot of such exciting um a spinal uh, column researches spinal cord researches uh, happening and it all depends what sort of uh, questions are you really trying to address so another um, important experiment are the spinal cord injections so either it be a stem cell or an adenovirus injections which are uh, used to label any part of the uh, cord segment so the surgical principle remains the same you sort of either you inject it blindly into the uh, spinal cord which is not really advisable whereas here they've done a very superficial exposure where the skin and muscles are retracted the spinal column is uh, stabilized using these fixators and then uh, partly the muscle is opened up then you can find what is known as this interlaminar space all right so here they've shown a cross mark that is the interlaminar space so you can really avoid uh doing the laminectomy which is time consuming and most of the time it can injure the dura so it is sort of uh, surgically demanding uh for doing laminectomy every time you want to do such procedures so for implants where you want to access the extradural space and you need to create a spinal window i can understand that you really have to do a extensive dissection and laminectomy but if you can sort of avoid laminectomy that's really great and for injections and for microdialysis to collect the csf and all that you can use this interlaminar space that are shaded in blue here on the right side so that can be accessed if you can use the microscope visualize the interlaminar space as it as you can see here you can directly enter the cord and the depth is only around 250 micrometer all right so that's a sort of um, coordinates what they have used from the midline they have taken 500 micrometer away from it and then 250 micrometer depth to reach so they have in fact used the um, ct imaging to do this i mean to do to do the injection without doing a laminectomy that's the intraspinal cord injections where you need to do a preclinical imaging to get an idea how big the interlaminar space is or there is going to be a significant learning curve where you do a trial and error access the space feel the loss of resistance something known as walking down the lamina or you know walking up the lamina so those steps can be used wherein you feel the lamina and a space where you don't feel the resistance just enter in and aspirate and when you see csf coming into your syringe you know that you are inside the dura if you all remember the steps which i discussed last time in a cord i mean in a, this is a spinal cord and that is let me draw it neatly so that you all can understand uh for example uh here let's say if this is the spinal column all right so i'll take this here and this is the spinal column you will have a spinous process like that all right 
so you try to pass the needle like that you will hit the lamina first which is the bone and you walk along the lamina until the free space is obtained in between the lamina that is this blue shade so you will feel the loss of resistance and then you poke in and when you feel that second loss of resistance then you aspirate and see if you can aspirate cerebrospinal fluid which is there in between the dura and the spinal cord all right so this is the spinal cord and i i, I think i'll have another slide where yeah exactly so if you're not doing the injection if you want to really aspirate this is one way of collecting the csf so this is exactly i was trying to explain that is the uh, dura and this is the uh, spinal brain substance in this case it is cisterna magna cisterna magna is the dilated csf space this blue is entirely the csf so wherever the csf space is dilated that's called cisterns and these cisterns around the brain has names whereas cisterna magna cisterna ambient scrotal cistern there are n number of cisterns that are in the uh, brain spaces so one such space where which is larger and easy to access is cisterna magna magna is obviously large cistern which is available in the dorsal aspect of the rat all right so between the uh, cerebellum and the spinal cord something as a junction as i keep saying cervical medullary junction there the cisterna magna is available and when you go through the spinous process as i was saying you will feel the second loss of resistance and you aspirate csf you can see the fluid then either you inject into the csf space which is called intrathecal injection all right or subarachnoid space if you remember the covering of the uh, or central nervous system there is dura mater just to give you a brief recap arachnoid matter and then pia mater all right so this is the second layer which will have this csf in its space and this is the pia mater which goes along with the uh, central nervous system which is tightly adherent to the actual uh, neural substance so when your needle passes through the dura and hits the arachnoid that's when you are in the fluid and this space is pretty narrow it's very very thin so you need to be really careful to feel the uh, loss of resistance and that's entirely tactile uh, feedback and then you aspirate and collect the csf as and as seen in this and csf collection or microdialysis is another uh, sort of minimally invasive way of looking into the central nervous system if your study involves a uh, collection of these sort of biological fluid this is one way of doing it and you need to know the anatomy inside out if you are trying to access these kind of spaces all right so if it's a spinal cord spinal canal and it's called lumbar puncture it's a very important diagnostic diagnostics to uh, diagnostic tool in patients for various infectious diseases like meningitis or for example even if there is a malignancy involving our cancer patients we need to collect the csf for studies which will have biochemical markers as well as the cellular markers for the pathology that you're dealing this is one way of collecting the uh, csf which is very very important to understand all right so with that we will uh, uh, conclude uh, today's session most of the basic procedures has been uh, covered as i keep um reiterating the same fact that as per your objectives and the research question you need to tailor these basic surgical steps and improvise it and then adopt it for your uh, research methodology hopefully this should be uh, these methodologies should be enough to start off and obviously with the various literatures and uh, literatures on surgery and on anatomy you need to club it and then make use of it to your best possible extent all right so thank you all so the next session will be dealing with the anesthesia part and then there is some uh, animal handling sessions and all that so most of the surgical sessions are are covered 
in the earlier lectures. Thank you all.